Welcome to Casual Friday. We are coming to you a couple days before the new year. So happy early new year to everyone listening. The fireworks are coming soon and appropriately after recent events in the Knicks world. And honestly, the predilections of the casual crew you have in front of you. Today's episode is bound to have some fireworks. As always, I am here with Mensa the Goat, Sean the Great, and an honorary casual crew member, GMAC, may make an appearance as he behind he is behind the scenes on the ones and twos. GMAC, do you want to hop up and handle some family business? I would love to, XJ. Thank you for, for pulling me up. Excited to produce the final Casual Friday of 2023. Uh, one of the last episodes we're going to do of 2023. Um, I need to, as XJ mentioned, handle some family business. So uh, you might not know this, but uh, we don't just enjoy basketball here at Nick's Film School. We also enjoy the sport of professional football, American professional football. And this season was the first ever fantasy football league that we did at KFS. And I want to commend XJ for uh, his fantasy football championship that he won this past weekend. He defeated one of our interns, Jeremy Goldstein, who uh, has an affinity for Evan Fournier and we love him anyway. Uh, but shout out to XJ on his his year one inaugural championship victory. You kind of ran rough shot over the league. I believe you only had two losses all season. Um, so is there any, three losses all season, as you pointed out. So XJ, this is your acceptance speech acknowledged for the people. Uh, congratulations on your win. You like to say a few words. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. GMAC. I wasn't expecting to get a shout out here. So that, that is very thoughtful. Uh, to be honest, you know, I have mixed views on, on fantasy football as far as how much of it is luck, you know, luck based. And despite my win, I still acknowledge that a lot of it is based on health. You know, you get, you draft players that you think are going to be good and they may be good. They may not be good. They may be good. And then they may get hurt. And that happens to a ton of people who play in fantasy leagues every year. And everyone knows that. So I had some fortune. My guy stayed healthy. My main guy stayed healthy, uh, especially uh, CD Lamb, who was a complete monster this year. So it was a great it was a great season. It was really fun. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing it again. Imagine if whoever wins a title this year for the NBA gets up on the podium and is like, you know, there's a lot of factors involved. There's just some luck to it. He you Jokic know. does. That's what he did. I mean, I don't necessarily believe we, that I'm the best We team. gave him I the parade and he had standing. to go home. There's injuries involved. What if Jimmy doesn't get hurt? What if what if Tatum doesn't get hurt? What if Randall doesn't? Like, you know, it's not a big deal, guys. But thanks anyway. XJ, you finished <laughs> with over 2,100 points in the league during the regular season, which is nuts over a 14 game season. Uh, shout out to Mensa, by the way, who also went 11 and 3. Yeah. So had the same regular season record as you, but suffered from the same thing that a lot of us who play fantasy football suffered. And it's that Tyree Kill got hurt right before the playoffs. So all of us that had Tyree Kill in all of our <laughs> leagues this year were completely screwed. And I know I speak on behalf of everybody that got eliminated because Tyree Kill wasn't available <laughs> over the last couple of weeks for their fantasy playoffs. So I empathize with you, Mensa. I do want to just say that I would not have won because uh, Jeremy Goldstein, who I played in the semis, he had James Cook and Christian McCaffrey in the fantasy football semis. And those guys combined for 71 points. So there yes. was no way I would have won anyway. Yeah. Um, first of all, in my big money league of all my friends, I had Tyree kill and I survived because, ah. um, that's why, um, and la ladies and gentlemen, two week playoffs, two leg playoffs. Think about it. Uh, number one, number two, I just want to give a shout out to myself for drafting <laughs> Calvin Ridley and Joe Mixon in rounds five and six, um, which basically torpedoed my season. So <laughs> thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thanks for nothing. Sean, where your shout out for the NFL goes to is that the real life football team you root for should probably be the Super uh. Bowl favorite at the moment. Um, we'll see if a matchup between your Ravens and XJ's Dolphins shows up sometime. In fact, they play each other this weekend. I'm so. not looking forward to this game. Yeah, at all. yeah. So we'll see if this is a, a, a conference uh, championship game preview. OK, we talked about the NFL enough. Uh, you guys got your shout outs. We had some fun. Uh, now let's, I'm sure, have the opposite of it. Enjoy your show, fellas. 
<laughs> Thank you very much, GMAC. Uh, that was very much appreciated. A shout out to our fantasy league, which was a ton of fun. And now on to something that may not be very fun. I'm not sure. We got to do a vibe check as we always do. Um, and I'm going to go around and ask my two compadres what the vibes are like. Let's start with Sean, because I want to give Mensa a second to compose his thoughts. Sean, uh, how are the vibes? Oh, <laughs> oh man. Um, the vibes are uh, laborious. And the vibes are laborious because it is hard sometimes to watch the things that we we have watched. Even though we are a good team, we are 17 and 13, I believe the record is. Um, I'm sure GMAC will check that. Or will keep, keep me honest on that. But, you know, we're above 500. We have lost arguably our most impactful player. Um, our Arguably our best player, High Busy, um, is having a career year. And um, yet there's a certain things that have happened that are just very laborious to watch and i'm sure we will get into those things as we as this show progresses but for me that's what the vibes are that laborious is a great word to describe the vibes i will go next and i will let mensa kind of uh, close it out for me i was thinking about this question and I'm not even sure how I'm feeling. It's really strange. Um, so I got to go to my handy emotions wheel. I don't know if you you all have ever seen or used an emotions wheel. You should try it out. A lot of time, men have difficulty uh, identifying our feelings. It's very helpful. And I took a look at the emotions wheel, and I realized for me the vibes they're just they're just mixed up. They're honestly mixed up. There's a lot of emotions I'm experiencing. We saw this glaring decision from Tibbs to pull Emmanuel quickly for RJ Barrett, the elephant in the room. Um, these kinds of things don't typically blow up like immediately, but this one did. And it was such a clearly bad decision that basketball pundits around the NBA noticed and started weighing in like, what is going on over there in New York? And it's just like people have been trying to sound the alarm on this for no exaggeration for years at this point, like Emmanuel quickly needs to play a lot of minutes and important minutes. And it's just, you know, it's frustrating that it took last night and honestly the Bucks game on Christmas for seemingly the basketball world to like recognize that. And at the same time, I'm sad for RJ Barrett that he has to kind of take the brunt of the wrath for it because I don't, I mean, RJ Barrett did the best that he could. He just really shouldn't have been in that situation. And if he, if he wasn't in the game, his struggles would be a footnote of the game. It would be like, yeah. And also RJ, she yikes. But now it's like, Hey, the forefront is RJ yikes. So I think, you know, a lot of mixed emotions around it. I'm just hoping that things kind of, you know, things look up. We're going forward and, and we'll see how it goes. So the vibes are mixed up for me. Um, Mensa, for you, sir, Sean, I, do you want to? <laughs> you look like you wanted to say something. I, 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 just, let you. <laughs> I just, I, I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath about <laughs> Mensa's vibe check. I'm sorry to laugh. Um, <laughs> I love you, Mensa. Mensa, Mensa, we we all love you, man. Um, how how are the vibes, Mensa? Um, how are the vibes? The vibes are. I want to. I don't really have I wish I had an emotions wheel because that would have been that would have been very informative in this moment because I'm looking for the right word to describe the vibes and I don't have it. So I guess I'll just roll through a couple of them. Um, the vibes one feel the vibes are cheated. That's that's where I'll start. Um, I say that because we were all cheated of an, from an Emmanuel quickly masterclass that we were witnessing because our head coach has an aversion against guys shorter than 6'6". Six, six. I don't know. I, don't, I can't explain why Emmanuel quickly was pulled from the game and RJ Barrett was inserted. I thought that was, um, to say the least, absurd. It was like, okay, we're going to take Emmanuel quickly out of the game, right? And then we are going to put our three power forward in the game with Jalen Brunson and Isaiah Hartenstein and let's see how this goes, right? It's just... 
it was it was embarrassing because the New York Knicks are an organization that I believe spends more money on analytics and cyber matrix than pre- cyber metrics than any team in the NBA. So they should know by now that quickly plus Brunson equals good. Right. And they should know by now that RJ plus Randall plus Hart equals bad. But we went to that anyway, and it immediately blew up in our face. So while the the original poor decision was to pull RJ Barrett and to insert a manual quickly, it then snowballed because RJ Barrett was having a terrible game, which which we've become accustomed to at this point. And like I'm watching the game and in my mind, I'm like, well, what well, what do you expect? Did you expect him to come in and be super RJ? Like, is that what you expected? Because you had super quickly in the game. And then you decided that wasn't good enough because here comes Jalen Williams taking a tough mid-range jumper. Oh my God, the world is ending. Let's it it oh my goodness. It's so frustrating. That that's the word there. The vibes are frustrating for me because a player that I still support to this day and still believe in, I still believe in RJ Barrett. Do I believe that he's a fit for this team? No. I don't think he fits anymore. I think that he's worse than redundant at this point because there's no reason for, and this is another thing that pissed me off about last night. Why just Jalen Brunson, our 46% three-point shooter, he's shooting five three PA. If he's shooting five, nobody else outside of Dante DiVincenzo should be around there. RJ Barrett, because of the role he's placed in on this basketball team, had to take seven three PA. That's not good. You do not want a guy who in his last 16 games is shooting under 30% take from three, taking seven three-pointers a game. So it's like you insert him into the game and it becomes insult to injury because here he is again in that right corner missing a three like he's been doing for the past month and some change. Like who, like if you were shocked that RJ Barrett had a poor close to the game last night, then you're just not paying attention. So it's frustrating to see, yes, the player is playing poorly. It's frustrating to see that the coach who, when RJ Barrett, mind you, is having a good game, gets pulled in the middle of the fourth quarter, like against Toronto. I think RJ Barrett scored either like seven, he had like three straight baskets or something. I don't remember off the top of my head. Gets pulled in two minutes and does not get inserted into the game until two minutes left. Right? So these are the things when he's having an okay game, he gets removed. When he's having the worst game of his season, yeah, let's take him back into the game for Emmanuel Quickly, who scored, I think, 22 points in 24 minutes at the time. That's frustrating. It's a frustrating coaching decision. It's a frustrating player. And then on the front office, why is there no contingency plan in place? RJ Barrett's numbers have been what they are for years at this point. I believed in him in spite of the numbers, but I'm a fucking fan. I'm a fan of the team. You are a front office executive. It has to be more than, oh, we believe in him. Don't believe in him. It's not your job. It's your job as a front office to hedge against that belief. And they did not hedge against that belief. And while the Knicks are 17 and 13, a lot of those wins came against Detroit. I, yeah, we, I think we played Detroit. We played, I think, Charlotte three times already. We played San Antonio. So when you remove those wins, what are we looking at? At this point, right? It's not who are we against the 500 ball clubs when we play Indiana or not Indiana, when we play Boston, we see how just how far away we are. When we played Milwaukee three of the four times, we saw just how far away we were. We play Oklahoma City, one of the best teams in the league. We see how far away we are from the elite. We play Minnesota. Minnesota dusts us. Right. So it's like we are not where we where we want to be. And a lot of that is because we have poor play coming from a guy who's our third usage player. R.J. Barrett's taken, what, 26% of the shots. Twenty. Well, he has 26 usage, so that's shots and turnovers, right? So 26% of our plays end in an R.J. Barrett shot or turnover, and that is not where we need to be right now. So it's frustrating that we are still relying on this player in the role that he is in. It's frustrating that the coach doesn't seem to recognize Emmanuel Quickly's value for four years in a row now. And it's frustrating that the front office has not put things in place. Whether or not they tried or not, they didn't try hard enough because there were there are moves they could have made along the way and we won't rehash those. But it's frustrating that we are at a place where what a guy that I believe in so much one is playing as poorly as he can, that again, the coach is not, is, is just not recognizing the value of the pieces on his roster. And I understand DDV played a good game. Quentin Grimes played a good game. Maybe if the front office didn't go get three shooting guards and maybe if they tried to get a small forward, maybe that could have helped. I don't know. I'm just a fan. I'm going to shut up and fan in a, another minute, but it's just, it's frustrating. It is so frustrating to the point where it's like, I haven't even wrapped my mind around 
the performance of this team last night and what it means for the team going forward. Because as of right now, I don't believe there's a way out of R.J. Barrett. I don't think his value is to a place where you can get a player who will improve the team. I don't be- unless you're attaching a lot of our picks war chest and we need those picks to get the elusive star player. Right. So it's just it's frustrating because it doesn't feel like for the first time in the Leon Rose era, I feel like we're stuck because it feels like we're stuck with RJ. It feels like Tibbs is, is who he is and that the front office doesn't have the the means by which to improve on a player like that in terms of um, the incremental role that he's in. He's the third best player on your team. You know, like you you probably want to get a player better than um, Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle, and you're going to need those picks to do that. Right now, we're staying in a place where we need the picks to move on from RJ, and that is just, it's not what you want. I yeah that was all extremely well said I feel very sympathetic with a lot of the 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 very strong emotions that you express Mensa and I I I think that they're well founded as well I I know we're in vibes and and we want to move on to the other topics but I do want to audible for a second and just really drill down on what we were talking about Sean, because I, Mensa, I think you make a great point. Like, what is the kind of way out of the RJ Barrett conundrum at this point? You know, um, and so I am really just like thinking about that myself. Is it you just reduce his minutes and put him in this like minuscule role and just kind of at this point, what eat his contract and just hope he can produce in a 20 to 25 minute per game kind of role? Do you uh, keep playing him and running him out there and hoping that he bounces back as we've seen him do at various other points in his career and have good stretches of games? Do you try to f- trade him and 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 get the Obi Toppin return for him if you can or attach a pick to 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 move him to another team? W- what is the what is the way forward for RJ Barrett? I wonder Sean, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Um I'm not attaching any picks to get off a player who's 23 years old. Um I, while I do think the running joke we like to make is that um, other teams watch tape also. So when we say things like, well, we, we can't bench him because his trade value go down. Like, no, his trade value is where it is, no matter whether he plays or doesn't play or starts or doesn't start. Um, <clears throat> honestly, for me, from a, there's, is a two, there's a, it's a two pronged approach. One is, and Mintz and I were discussing this in the campus faculty chat beforehand, uh, control what you can control. And while I don't believe that RJ Barrett has been placed in the ideal environment for his skill set since the day he became a New York Nick, um, you have to like, you have to be better. And I say that because we have seen fits and starts of RJ seven, eight, nine game stretches where he plays well and the process is there and he does, he makes the right basketball play. He does the things that he's supposed to do. And then for some reason it just goes away. And that is what he can do. Um, the second thing we can do, um, I will get to that a little bit later on in the show in our next segment because I don't want to step on it. But there's something else that there's something else this organization can do to help RJ Barrett, because at the end of the day, it is our job. It is their job as an organization to put their players in the best position to succeed. Yeah, and I I, I have a thought and I don't want to step on what you might say later as well. Um, so I want to make sure we don't we, we don't cross any wires there. As far as what I would do with RJ Barrett, which again may come up as as we go forward, Sean, and uh, yeah, I don't know. We we just all have things that we want to see improve. We have things that we want to see change. You know, as we approach the end of the year, we not only reflect on the year that has passed, but we start to look forward to the next year and how we'd like to see things go. You know, we get that that fresh start effect, and people make their New Year's resolutions. Also, by the way, don't make a New Year's resolution. Ninety percent of New Year's resolutions fail, and it's really hard to stick to something that don't just don't 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 do it. Take my advice, don't do it. Um, but on I that have a note, take about New Year's resolutions. We'll get if we have time at the end, we'll get to it. All right, all right. I'll I'll, I'll remember and ask you about it. Um, but uh, but on that note, our big topic for this episode is to talk about for twenty twenty four our one big wish for twenty twenty four. Um, yeah, I I I think that I can kind of 
imagine where a couple of us are going with it, but I'm really excited to hear what all both of your big wishes are and, and see how we can see if those things are realities that can move forward. Um, I will, I will go second. So why don't we start with Mensa Mensa? You were hot. You you got going. Do you want to drop on us your one big wish for 2024? Sure. So my one big wish for 2024, because I'm sure somebody else will have a wish for nine. Um, So my wish is going to be that the New York Knicks figure out a way, well, not even figure out a way. My wish is that Isaiah Hardenstein will play well enough for the Knicks to keep him as the starting center going forward over one Mitchell Robinson. The reason why I'm making this wish is because I haven't checked the numbers for today, but up until last night, Isaiah Hartenstein was, I think, 10th or 11th in the NBA in defensive EPM. And I believe that he gives you more multiplicity in your offense because he works as a passing hub, right? Um, And then he even has like a floater where Mitchell Robinson's offensive game is really more dunk the ball. And there's a lot of value in that because he gives you what's known as vertical spacing. And Isaiah Hartenstein is not the same vertical spacer, but that's not even the reason why. Well, it's a two-prong reason. It's because one, Isaiah Hartenstein is really good. And the other three-prong reason. Third, second would be because Mitchell Robinson over the course of his career just can't stay healthy. And it's kind of hard to tie your wagon to a guy who I think is averaging around like between 50 and 60 games when your defense, especially because of the way Tom Thibodeau likes to coach, his defense is essentially tied to Mitchell Robinson. So I want to remove that from the uh, from the playing field just because it's kind of a crutch for a guy like Tom Thibodeau. Um, and then third is because Mitchell Robinson has a great contract that can be used going forward to be put in a star trade or trade to upgrade at the small forward. So I think that it's time for us to move on from the Mitchell Robinson experiment. And the only way to do that is for Isaiah Hartenstein to show and prove that he can handle the starting center minutes. And I do believe he can do it. I think he's been really good. I think he'll remain very good. And the most important thing about Isaiah Hartenstein, he doesn't miss games. Isaiah Hartenstein, as a Nick last year, played all 82. Isaiah Hartenstein played every game in the playoffs, and he is playing every game so far this season. I value availability when it comes to basketball players in general. The best ability is availability. Isaiah Hartenstein gives you elite availability, and he's proving to be an elite defender. And I think at the center position, if your center is always available and your center is an elite defender, that is what you want out of your starter. So that is my wish, is that Isaiah Hartenstein will command and keep the starting center role long term. Yeah, I love that. And I largely agree with you. I think I think it's tough because obviously, like you said, Mitch does so much to impact the game on both ends. It's crazy to be like, hey, this guy that we have behind him, he may be better and he may do more to enhance the, all of the, the great strengths that our offensive players have and, and be able to hold his own on the defensive end as well to the point where we'd rather have that guy than, than Mitchell Robinson, the most dominant offensive rebounder of the last decade, at least. So I think it's a great point and I, 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 I don't refute your wish whatsoever. Um, Sean, do you want to say anything about that wish or, or I can just go on? No, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, funny. I thought last year that there was a real chance that Isaiah Hardenstein might be the starting center. Um, might take over the starting center job from Mitch last year um, for some of the reasons that meant to mention, including um, his lack of a bit M- Mitch's uh, inability to st- play 72 games in a season combined with the things that Isaiah Harnstein can do. So um, if we get to a place where the organization has to make a decision between who is a starter, that means we have two starters, which means we're in a really good place. Um, these are problems that I do not mind having. So, uh, that's a fair wish. And, you know, as as much as it stinks because it's based on the inability of Mitch to stay healthy and Mitch is a monster when he's on the court, uh, sometimes you kind of have to remove the the support, um, to remove the crutch, for lack of a better phrase, um, because our head coach, as we are as we are seeing in real time in 4K, everything. And I, listen, I've, I've said this for I've said this, I said this for months. This team is built around Mr. Robinson on both sides of the ball. And 
the contingency plan can't be just find another Mitchell Robinson because clearly those guys don't grow on trees. Yep. Absolutely. Well said. Um, I will go ahead and move forward with my wish, my one wish for 2024 before we go to Sean's. So there's an obvious wish here (laughs) and I, I appreciate, I'm going to assume that you all left it for me. Everyone knows that I've been uh, consistently a huge believer in Emmanuel quickly, his talent, his impact, my wish is what it's always been. And maybe we'll see it in 2024. It'd be a Christmas miracle um, that Emmanuel quickly gets more than 30 minutes per game for the rest of 2024. There are three players whose percentile rank in minutes are lower than their percentile rank in impact on the New York Knicks. Isaiah Harnstein, the one that you just mentioned, Mensa. So, you know, great player that has not got as much shine as he should. Dante DiVincenzo, who has been completely shooting the lights out. And Emmanuel Quickly. Emmanuel Quickly. It is rare that a player as good and as impactful as Emmanuel Quickly struggles to get half of the minutes in a game. That, like, I... I can't express how rare that is that somebody as good as quickly on both ends does not play 24 minutes in a game. That is very uncommon. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I, the, the other thing I want to say about is for me, my perspective on basketball is that I don't try to construct the perfect lineup from the bottom up. And what I mean by that is I don't go in and say, you know, I need two wings and I need a wing who's six, eight, and I need a wing who's six, six, and they have to be this strong and they have to be, that is not how I would construct lineups. I would construct lineups by saying, you know, more or less, here's what I think. Here's the kind of dynamic I think would work. Let me throw those guys out there and then let's see. And if it works and if it's effective, I'm going to keep doing it. (laughs) And if I don't know exactly why I'll try to figure out why, but I'm not going to, it's a, it's a mostly a top down approach as opposed to a bottom up approach. I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to see how it works. If it's effective, we'll figure out the reasons why. And then maybe we can try to replicate that moving forward. But I think it's like something like what Toronto tried to do with the whole vision six, nine. Okay. Like we have this view of how we can construct the lineup. We're going to have these wings and we're going to have, and it's like, cool. That's a great theory. Put it out there. Is it, does it work? Does it work? If it works, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, let's go to something else. And I think we see that Emmanuel quickly, when he plays a lot of minutes in all of his lineups, they're extremely successful. They win on both ends, especially on the defensive end. He, his limitations, whatever they may be theoretically in terms of his physique, his size, his strength, his speed. I don't know, whatever it is, his ball handling, whatever the things that we can point out as far as deficiencies that he has, it's fine. And it may be true, but guess what? When he's on the court, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And it's the whole, you know, I was, I was, I was talking to, uh, to Jeff Frank Barrett, one, one nine, who I do a podcast with, and he mentioned Moneyball, And we know the whole idea behind Moneyball was guys are really, really good. And they get undervalued because of how they look or because of attributes that they have or because they have a weird batting stance or they have a weird like pitching uh, form. And honestly, those things don't matter. Who cares? I don't care. All I care about is when the guy plays, are we successful? (laughs) And Emmanuel quickly is the ultimate when the guy plays, we are successful. That is the guy. And that's just honestly, the fact is that I'm a Knicks fan first. And the reason why that's my wish is because I think that's best for the New York Knicks. Not because I, I think it's best for Emmanuel quickly. I do think obviously it's best for quickly, but I think it's best for the team. I think it's best for the organization. And my wish really comes down to that. I want to see the Knicks be successful. I think they've been good this year. I think they can be better. I think there's a little bit more meat on the bone. And I think playing Emmanuel quickly more minutes at the expense of whoever else, I honestly don't care. Um, I think that can get us to, to, to access that meat on the bone. So that's where I'm at. That is my, my one wish for 2024. Do either of you have a, a comment on that? As, as GMAC says in my ear, he, he calls Emmanuel quickly, Scott Hatterberg, <laughs> uh, a, a money ball reference there. But either of you want to talk about that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I had a tweet about this earlier, um, and I'll just read my tweet. Emmanuel Quickly and Jalen Brunson have been on the court together for 713 possessions this season. They have a net rating of plus 13.6, which is in the 97th percentile of all lineups. Telling me Quick is too small to play with Brunson might get you blocked today. And then I quote tweeted that one, right? Okay. 
live podcast and we love it. Finding my quote tweet. Here we go. Boom. And last year, they shared the court for 1,906 possessions and had a net rating of 12.1. So we are looking between the two. We're looking at about 2,600 possessions plus of data that tell us that Emmanuel quickly plus Jalen Brunson equals good. Play Emmanuel quickly. I do not care that he is not six foot six. I don't care that he can't cross tween with the best of them. I don't care about any. I don't care that he's not the best on ball defender. I don't care about any of that. What I care about, like XJ said, is that when Emmanuel quickly plays basketball, good things happen for my basketball team. I want more good things to happen for my basketball team. And in order for that to happen, Emmanuel quickly will need to see more than 30 minutes. I could not give a rat's ass about the log jam because the log jam does not affect Julius Randle. The log jam does not affect Jalen Brunson and it should not because they are our best players. The log jam should not affect Emmanuel quickly because he is one of our, say it with me now, best players. It shouldn't affect him. Let it affect everybody else. And for the organization to not understand this to me is just shooting ourselves in the foot and you can't continue to do that because these guys are humans. Emmanuel quickly is a human. If you watch the the Thunder game, when Emmanuel and we watched it live, when Emmanuel quickly got subbed out, you could see his body sink. He was not happy about leaving the game at the time where he loved the game. So how how often do you think you can do that to what a 24-year-old basketball player who's I think he turns 25 next year? These guys are young. They're trying to make their name in the league. And we have a roster and a coach who is getting in the way of these guys making real money, like real generationally changing money. So while I'm with XJ and the thing that I care about most as a fan, is it affecting my team positively? I also care about the human being because as a fan, I like the guys who play for my team. And I think the Knicks have done a good job develop, um, drafting good character guys. Manuel quickly, one of the best character guys in the league, pay him what he's worth. And in order to pay him what he's worth, play him what he's worth. Play him what he's worth. He'll show you what he's worth. And then you pay him what he's worth. That's all you have to do. Everything else would figure itself out. But do not sacrifice one of your best players at the altar of RJ, Quentin Grimes, DiVincenzo. Guys who, cool, no problem with them for me. But you have to play your best player. Like I said on the playback, it's, this, it's the equivalent to me of saying, hey, LeBron, we have to cut your minutes by 10 a game because we have this Paul George guy. Like, it, like who cares? Just play them both. It's the same thing. It's just, it's, it's frustrating. And I'm right there with you. It is also one of, if I was given two wishes, that would be, that would have been my second wish. Play Emmanuel quickly. I mean, listen, y'all, y'all covered it. Like it's, it's, <clears throat> the, it, as a wise man once said, the game will tell you what to do. The game is telling you what to do. So do it. That's all. That is, that is well said. Well said, uh, short and concise. And actually, we're just going to turn it right back around to you, Sean. What is your one wish for 2024? So me saying, quoting the wise man who said the game will tell you what to do is very is related to my one wish. Um, we are recording this on December 28th. You're listening to this on December 29th, which means we are approaching not only New Year's Day, but the first of the month. And for many people in America on the first of the month, the rent is due. And my wish is that copyrighted, excuse me, trademarked by one Mensa Smith, rent due Tibbs shows up in 2024 and shows up for the rest of the season. That's my wish. Um, it is related to many of the things that we discussed here, the lineups, the rotations, uh, IQ playing. Um, John said on the post game after OKC that uh, Tom Thibodeau is a box checker and he is one of the best box checkers. And the fact that he over he reviews every situation, says, OK, in this situation, I'll do this. In this situation, I'll do that. In this situation, I'll do this. And he's right. No one is more prepared for no one is more prepared than Tom Thibodeau. However, um, John also said, and this is, you know, if you know John, like 
this 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 means a lot coming from him. He said, and I quote: "Sometimes you got to read the fucking room." And where Tom Thibodeau fails is that he does not read the fucking room. I'm going to read a tweet myself. Um, this f- tweet is from Frank Barrett, a.k.a. Jeff, who co-hosts the Hot Hand 30 podcast of 1XJ. Please be sure to check that out on all, uh, on all your podcast platforms. Um, <clears throat> and he had, this, he had this thread last year about Tibbs. Not last. Yes, last year, but during the 21-22 season, the thumbs down season, whatever you want to call it. And it, it 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 went over the things, you know, the issues that Tibbs had been facing. And he said, and I'm going to read this, where other better coaches increase flexibility and see what works, Tibbs takes the opposite approach. He knows what works. That is why, despite the fact that Kemba has been benched almost half the season, he's still part of a lineup that's played 100 more minutes than any other. And he tweeted this on March 16th, well after Campbell was out of the lineup. And in his next his next tweet or in this thread was, this is extremely short-sighted, especially for an average team. We saw how last season, some argued, quote unquote, it's working as Elf started every game. But look at the domino effect it created. We signed Campbell because we, quote unquote, needed a backcourt upgrade. Would we have felt this way had IQ started all along? People were asking these questions in March of 2022. We are, as you're listening to this, two days away from 2024. Coloring within the lines will only get you so far. It will only get you so far. Um, I, I, one of my favorite movies of all time is White Man Can't Jump. And in that movie, uh, Billy Hoyle played by Woody Harrelson in a back and forth with uh, Sidney Dean played by Wesley Sipes has this quote that I've, I've, it applies to so many things in life. He says to Sidney Dean, you'd rather look good and lose than look bad and win. And I've said this for the longest. Tom, there's a story that Tom Thibodeau loves winning. And he wants to win every game. And I push back on that because I say, it's not that Tom Thibodeau wants to win every game. It's he wants to not lose every game because that is why you decide to put R.J. Barrett in for Emmanuel quickly, who has 22 points on 10 shot attempts because, and he, as he said in the post game, it was the size. It was, they wanted the, they wanted the size. That's someone who doesn't want to lose. Now, his rigidity, his principles, his system – will establish a certain baseline level of competence that, listen, the worst season he had at the, as a Knicks coach is 37 wins. That's the, that is the absolute floor. And that was with traffic cones in the backcourt in Campbell Walker and Evan Fournier. Um, but it, it's just at some point, like that shit is going to get you fired. Because at some point, you're going to have to read the room. And, we def- and the, the frustrating part about it is we have seen Tibbs make the changes needed when his back is against the wall, when he's cornered, where he's where he's damn this shit out of luck. So it's frustrating. Very similar to RJ when we say, like, RJ, we've seen you do these things, but then you go back to this. Tibbs, we've seen you do the things that the game is telling you to do, but you don't do it. And <clears throat> for me, that is for someone who, again, doesn't want to win as much as he wants to not lose. Because if he loses, it's like, well, you know, I went with this and it didn't work, but I know it works. So guess what? Maybe if I had OG and Anobi, this would have worked out, but I don't. Well, guess what, Tom? You don't have OG and Anobi. He's not walking through that door, partially because we're suing them. So, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> Listen, there are, I've always said that there are A coaches, B coaches, and C coaches. The C coaches, the C stands for can't coach. The A coaches and the B coaches, those are the guys you can win with. But the B coaches, they want to do things a certain way. They have a system. They have a process. They have a style. 
then everything has to fit in that style. If it doesn't go wrong, it's not them. It has to be them. It can't be me because I know it works because this is my system. The A coaches say, this is what I have. Let me put my guys in the best position to succeed instead of just running my shit because I know it works. Now, you can win with the B coach. Listen, um, if you ask me, Frank Vogel was a B coach. If you ask me, um, what's the dude from um, Milwaukee? Uh, Mike Budenholzer is a B coach. I, Byron Scott went to the NBA Finals two years in a row, and you're not going to tell me that he's an A coach. But you can win with B coaches, but there's a reason why they're B coaches and they're not A coaches. Um, earlier, you mentioned uh, Mensa about uh, Isaiah Hardenstein being a starting center. There is things that Isaiah Hardenstein can do. But oh, we don't have, and listen, oh, I'm not, and let me let me let me say this because now it sounds like I'm ranting, I'm angry, whatever. Like, I'm not gonna sit here and blame Tom Thibodeau for all the issues of this organization, like some people do, because that's ridiculous. And I'm not gonna say he's a bad coach because that's that's absolutely insane. Um, but the the clock is about to get late real early, and I want when I see like it is just like Yes, the roster construction is flawed. We have six shooting guards. Our backup point guard is 6'4". Our 3 and D wing shoots 32% from three and plays defense so every so often. Our, um, our point guard, who's amazing, gets killed on defense. The roster construction leaves something to be desired. But there are things you can do. But you know what? We never see three guard lineups. We never see small ball. We never see Jews at the five. We never see like we just never see these. We just never see these things. Like, um, so at some point, like, if I, I I'm just saying that like this shit is cool being four games over five hundred. And listen, I re- I'm one of the people who on the internet say like, listen, I. I remember what it like, used to be like before you got here. And I don't want to go back to that shit, right? But at some point, it can't just be like, well, he made us better. Like, you got to take the next step. And part of the next step is Thibodeau looking in the mirror and saying, like, don't wait until you're, don't wait until James Dolan is calling into his office to ream you out. Say, like, all right, for us to get where we need to be, this is what we need to do. So I, my one wish is that I see rent due Tibbs way way sooner than we should yeah i i think that's great i i would you know if this mic wasn't expensive technical equipment that we need to do our jobs i tell you to drop it because that was i think that was really great uh I, i'm not going to add too much to it because i have a feeling that the tips conversation may come up <laughs> as we continue on the pod we are going to round out the pod with two of our typical segments that we do every week shout outs and unserious. And, you know, I, I'm not sure Tibbs may make an appearance in one, in one of those segments, but probably not this one. (laughs) Uh, welcome to shout outs. Uh, you know, we give a shout out to somebody who in the Knicks universe, uh, we think is deserving of one and we think has done a good job or done something interesting or special over the last little while since our last casual Friday for me, for me, I, mine is a more subdued one. It's going to be pretty short and concise. Uh, mine is a shout out to Dante DiVincenzo. And the reason why I want to shout out Dante is the guy has just come in and just done his job. He has been quiet. He has not said a word. He has not asked for touches. He has not asked for minutes. He is currently averaging 21 minutes per game, which is the lowest since his rookie season. He is, has a, about a 17 usage when he's out there. The guy is just out there doing his role, playing defense really hard, causing turnovers, is in the 90th percentile and steal percentage, is shooting the complete lights out 46% from three, the highest of his career. He is able to play off of Julius Randle. He's able to play off of Jalen Brunson. He's in some of our best lineups with the the Nova crew and plays really well, basically against, you know, next to anybody he's with, um, is a really good rebounder for his size, does everything he can to impact the game. And you don't hear a peep out of him. He's just kind of even keel, does a little wild thing every now and then, like trying to dunk on somebody from the free throw line. But he is fearless. Um, You know, he's assertive. He plays 
plays his role. He doesn't complain. And I think he just deserves a shout out because those guys kind of go unheralded around the, the NBA where, you know, they're, you, they're not too loud. They're not too boisterous. They're just kind of doing their job and executing. And I think it, it's really upon us to elevate those guys and point out the fact that they're doing that at a high level. And it seems simple, but... <laughs> It is rare. It is rare. And we we know a bunch of guys across the league who are not able to do their jobs at a high level and execute their roles um, really to perfection as Dante DiVincenzo has. He has improved from the earlier in the season when I think he had a slow start and has kind of consistently gotten better in almost a linear fashion, just better and better and better as he's been thrust into the starting lineup. He has had no drop off. And yeah, I, I just want to give a shout out to Dante DiVincenzo for that reason. Any of you guys have a thoughts on DiVincenzo or want to go ahead and segue into your shout out, Sean? No, but real quickly. I mean, listen, d- listen, while, you know, the defense is something to be desired, but we knew that coming in, like he's coming and he's like, this team's need a shooting. That's what he's provided. So um, he's lights out from three. He is a he is a welcome addition to this team. Um, so I I was thinking about giving he was one of my uh, nominees for, for a shout out. So good job by you, XJ. Yeah, yeah I was he was going to be my shout out. So I had to quickly pivot because um, I like to use like the shout out segment specifically to shout out guys who I have either doubted or put other play players ahead of them. And Dante DiVincenzo is not a guy that I wanted to start at shooting guard. I wanted Emmanuel quickly to get those minutes. I wanted him to play well um, because and I think just Emmanuel quickly deserves it. He's in a contract year. You don't want to pay him like a starter, prove that he's not a starter, give him the starting role and see what he does with it. And he didn't get the starting role. DiVincenzo got it. And he's been nothing but nails ever since. So I'm um, really, really happy that he got the shout out today because that's where I was going if you didn't. The cool thing about DiVincenzo, I think, and, and it's why I, w- I wanted to give him the shout out as well, is that if you put quickly in the starting lineup and DiVincenzo had to go back to the bench... It'd be fine. I think it'd be fine. I don't think you would you would hear a peep out of him. I think he'd be like, "Cool, that's my role. I'll, I'll excel at that. Whatever you need me to do, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability." And that, the the chips let the chips lie where they may. And I think that's a really cool approach. I think I think he feels good and financially secure, so that becomes part of it. But I, I do think that's an awesome approach, and I'm glad that he's able to take it. And I'm glad that he's part of the team because I, I just don't want people to think that because I am a huge supporter of Emmanuel quickly that and when we acquired Dante, I, my first thought was, ah, oh, shit quickly's minutes. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't like DiVincenzo and think that he's a great addition. So, uh, I just wanted to filibuster a little bit to buy, <laughs> to buy you both time to pivot to, <laughs> to a different, uh, shout out since I stole each of yours. And I'm sorry about that. Uh, Mensa, who do you want to give a shout out to? So when, when in doubt, there's one player you can shout out no matter what. And that guy's name is Jalen Brunson. Um, I, I really quickly want to shout out Jalen Brunson because all-star voting has commenced. Uh, Christmas, there was the opportunity to do the, uh, you, you vote for a guy that counts for three. And I've been voting every single day. And I think that it's important for us to vote for a guy like Jalen Brunson to be an all-star because we're the biggest market. We have the biggest fan base. So, well, I don't know if we have the biggest fan base between us and the Lakers, but we have one of the biggest fan bases in the NBA and our guys should be represented. Um, Jalen Brunson, after he was told by basically everybody that can't be a 1A, can't be this, can't be that. Uh, I want to shout out Blood of the Panther on Twitter because he said, who cares about being 1A when you're A1? And that's Jalen Brunson. Jalen Brunson is A1 sauce. Um, For the month of December, we have, what, 12 games here, 35.9 uh, minutes. He's shooting 40% from three. 79% from the field for, for the free throw line, which is bad for Jalen Brunson, but he's averaging 27 points. He's giving you 6.8 assists, 4.4 rebounds. If those are not all star numbers for a guard, I don't know what is. And another thing that I'm really proud of with Jalen Brunson is last year, he was a seventh percentile defender by a defensive EPM. This right now he's averaging what 1.3 steals a game. And that's not everything on defense, but watching him play the game, you can see that he's using those intel that his intelligence to read where the pass wants to go. And he's getting basically, he's like playing free safety and catching interceptions and pushing the ball down court. So I'm really happy with what Jalen Brunson has been able to do as a defender. And I think that with this shout out goes without saying, go vote 
all-star Jalen Brunson because he absolutely deserves it. I don't care if he does not get the nod to be a starter. I just want when the all-star numbers roll through that Jalen Brunson sees that the New York fan base did not let him down and has him as one of the top vote getters. So go vote for Jalen Brunson for all-star. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I just want to say really quickly. I mean, I, it's we know it's very difficult to be a high impact defensive player when you have such an immense offensive load. Just look at Tyrese Halliburton, who <laughs> has an immense offensive load and is and has been one of the worst defensive players in the entire NBA. Jalen Brunson still has that offensive load, but has improved his defense substantially. And everyone knows I love EPM. Jalen Brunson has improved his EPM every single year he's been in the M- and the NBA. Really incredible what Brunson's been able to do. And he is only 27 years old. So I think that is a well-deserved shout out and definitely will be voting uh, daily for him for the All-Star game. Sean, it is on you. So um, I actually... Um, I'm going to go with Quentin Grimes because um, Quentin Grimes very quietly since moving to the bench has improved. He's shooting 40% from three, or shooting over 40% from three. The defense is still there and solid. Uh, of course, like, for example, I got 11 minutes against Oklahoma City, but we've already beat that horse oblivion. But, you know, <clears throat> it's uh, not a lot of people will, will say, hey, I want to go to the bench, um, which is basically what he said about saying it publicly. Um, but he recognized, he recognized like, you know, this is the best position for me to succeed given the current, given the current makeup of the roster um, and the rotations and substitution patterns. And he, and he went to the bench and he has improved. So shout out to him. Um, I, my, um, yeah, just, just a shout out to Grimes because, you know, a, not a lot of, you know, we make a lot of hubbub about the quickly minutes and rightfully so, but, you know, Grimes, Grimes isn't playing as much. And this is, this is a player that Tom Thibodeau really liked in the draft. It's the player that we saw was essential to our success this year. We thought he would be the key to unlock a lot of things. Um, because, you know, Jalen Brunson is not the best defender. So, J- so Grimes would have those assignments. So, I'm gonna give him. I'm gonna give him a shout out um, for you know just putting his head down and working. And like honestly, you never heard a word from Grimes before. You never heard a word from Grimes since. And you know, big up to him for that. Yeah, it's kind of funny because uh, Grimes was going to be my other uh, shout out that I would give for the for the same reasons that you mentioned, Sean. I think there's a lot to this idea of you know things are going well for you, the role's not working out, you move to a different role, you got to stay at it, and Grimes has done that really well and has really excelled in his role and and seems to be kind of getting back on track defensively um, from a scoring ang- angle, uh, from an aggression and assertiveness angle. So I, I totally agree with that. I think that's very well deserved as we transition to our final segment, which is our why so unserious segment. We have Andrew Claudio jumping up on the stage with us. What do you have to say to us, Andrew? Just in the interest of time and... Well, I, 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 I'm not trying to cut your episode short, obviously. I just I always have a timer in my brain of like once we get to an hour, that's like the sweet spot. And I think I speak on behalf of the entire casual crew, unless you have someone else you'd like to go to. We could collectively ask Tom Thibodeau, why so unserious, sir? And I'm like, I'm, I'm joining in on the chorus. I've just talked to way too many intelligent people over the last couple of days, you're, you three included, that are like, all right, well, why why so unserious? Like that that RJ sub was bad. The RJ sub on Christmas was bad. Uh quickly and his minutes have not made too much sense. Like there there's clearly a better way to distribute this. So um if you'd like to, we can we can I, I'll let you guys say your pieces if you want to, but uh we could collectively ask Tom Thibodeau why so unserious. Well, I already lit his ass up about 10 minutes. Oh, ago, yes. So I'll, I know. I'll, 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 I'll yield the floor to uh, XJ and Mensa. So I, when when Sean went, I was thinking, I was like, I, let me not respond because one of us is going to give it to Tibbs, if not both of us. So I, I'm totally on board. And in fact, 
Andrew, I would love if you stayed up with us because I'd love to hear you join in on the chorus for the Why So In series about Tom Thibodeau. So fire him. Fire his ass into the sun. Okay. He's not just a C coach. He's a D coach as in don't (laughs) want you to be my coach anymore. Now, look, here's here's the the rock and the hard place. I I continue to find myself in when evaluating this head coach because I believe rent through Tibbs has existed a lot more than we give it credit for. I believe that the baseline culture that every single freaking team that comes in to play the Knicks that says like, oh, they're a tough team to play, they're physical, and then we go and watch like what the Pistons are and watch what like the lowest hanging of fruit and watch what Atlanta is and watch what these other teams that are stumbling through their 82 game schedule are. And it's like, okay, I know my team's well coached. I know my team plays hard. I know that's not like a baseline I could expect for every team. And I appreciate that that's what my coach has brought to this. I also wish Emmanuel quickly would play more. Like it, it's, it's very much a two things can be true. And while I do think that the log jam, man, like the RJ of it all is, is getting very scary. Like I, I meant I love you. Um, the, the stat that I, I you'll hear it on the pregame pod when it drops after this episode, but um, I went on Fred Katz's Cats and Shoot today uh, to to help him. I facilitated the mailbag questions his way, and he quoted R.J. Barrett's stats since the uh, since the migraines or since the Monstars took his powers. Um, and I had just recently looked those stats up, so like we both joined in together to quote them. Uh, he is shooting. He is in a forty three point nine effective field goal percentage in those 18 games since the migraines on a 26.6 true uh, uh, usage rate over the time. So he's, he's got the third highest usage in that time and he's got an effective field goal percentage under 44. If you were to stretch that out over a, a full season, which like it's, it's an unrealistic to fully say that, like let's come back in a month if RJ's still doing it and reevaluate it that way. But to give you an idea of how low those who don't know what a 44 effective field goal percentage is, um, Kobe Bryant in his last year in the league was one of the worst high usage players ever. And that's the last time you can go to a player that had that high a usage and that low an effective field goal percentage over a full season. That's how bad RJ's been. He's been last last year of his career Kobe over this 18 game stretch. And it's tough for me to fully forgive Tibbs because like Emmanuel quickly should should play more, but it's also a part of me that's empathizing with him. And I'll, I'll I'll see the floor back over to you guys. Like there's clearly a front office. I don't know if it's an agenda or an initiative, but like you can't cut this guy's minutes too much. So that way we can't trade him in a couple months. And as a result, the only hope is like you play him and hopefully he gets better. And as a result, other guys that are under control, like Quentin Grimes, like Emmanuel quickly, like DiVincenzo have to suffer and so, like, it's a rock and a hard place for me in, in, in that sense. So, I don't know. The, the politics of it all lead to him making inexcusable decisions in the long term. The, the macro, like, he shouldn't have gone into the game last night. That was lunacy. Like, that, that, that in, the, in the very vacuum of one game against the Thunder, I don't even think they're going to win the game. I just, like, in that, that four-minute stretch, like, I, when we were doing the watch-along, you guys were there. I thought it was Steven Chenzo coming into the game. And to your point about the shout-out, even Chenzo has been on fire over the last month. So I can at least accept it. I wouldn't have thought it was the right move, but like, you know what? I understand. He wants some size. Even Chenzo's still like a, a credible shooter. That's fine. Um, instead, he went to, I think, the worst possible option that he could have went to. Like, if he went to Deuce, I'd have been like, all right, he's, he's, got, he's got better defense out there. I would have understood. Um, so that's my, my very extended two cents on why Tom Thibodeau, at least in this sense, is a, a bit unserious. Yeah. And, and, and I love that. I think I agree with largely everything that you said. I don't have a ton to add. What I have to add is, I mean, I will say Tibbs was put in a difficult, precarious situation. And I believe that occurred as soon as the DiVincenzo signing happened. Like it was immediately like, Hey, there's this minutes log jam. What are we going to do about it? And Tibbs is going to have to figure something out. And And real quick, actually to your point, the day that signing happened, you were on it. Like this is a thing we discussed this (laughs) summer, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was like that the minute that it happened, it's like, dang, Tibbs is in a tough spot. Hopefully he can figure it out. And I don't feel like that was necessarily fair to him. I, I, 
I think they need to have a plan coming into the season. I'm not saying that they did, and I'm sure that they did. But the way that he handles situations like the the OKC game, I think that is just it just reflects a, a level of kind of stubbornness that I just think rears its ugly head occasionally. And when it does, it feels so egregious. And it's like, listen, I know that this is your philosophy and your principle about basketball, but at the same time, you want to win this game. Knicks fans want to win this game. Try something that you haven't tried before because we've seen this stuff be super effective. We see you see the numbers. He sees the numbers. He sees the data. I know he does. And I think it's just fair to have the expectation that at this point in time, he is able to kind of spread his wings. And and he's done that in a lot of other ways. He's tried lineups that we don't he doesn't usually try. I was thinking earlier, I'm like, you know, uh, it sucks that he never plays a three guard lineup. And I was like, watch, let me check how many minutes DiVincenzo has spent at the three, probably zero. And it's like, no, he's played like 20 percent of his time at the three, which is more than I would expect for tips for tips to do. I'm sure he doesn't want to. And, um, you know, and so I appreciate that. But it's like you got to expand in this one specific area and it seems like there's some aversion and I don't think that this is like a real thing like he has a personal problem with Emmanuel quickly or anything like that but it seems like there's this aversion when it comes to Emmanuel quickly to putting him in situations that he just doesn't believe he fits in and I think to, the unseriousness comes into like Tibbs you got to grow on that you got to grow on that I know you have this view he's 6'3 Emmanuel quickly six three and under two hundred pounds, and guess what? He has an amazing impact anytime he's on the court. And you got to grow in that area. He's grown in a lot of other areas. I think he can grow in this one. We'll see if you know the the, the twenty twenty four uh, Sean's twenty twenty four wish comes true, and we see continued growth. But to me, that's why he gets the why so unserious. All right. So for me, with this why so unserious for Tom Thibodeau, um, Andrew, I understand those stats. Um, quite frankly, I don't really care about them at this point because this is who, like you said, this is who RJ has been over the past 18 games. And right now we are discussing what he did over the past week. You know, RJ Barrett's been playing poorly. Um, he gives you one good game every three or four at this point. And he gave you a good game on Christmas. He wasn't giving you the good game the day after. That has been the law of averages. Um, another thing that we don't discuss because it's faux pas, I guess. Um, the re- one of the reasons the RJ um, Randall Hart stuff doesn't work is not just that RJ Barrett has been bad, but the other reason is that that lineup extrapolates his bad play because Julius ain't shooting that shit. Hart ain't shooting that shit. So you know who has to shoot that shit? R.J. Barrett. And you know what R.J. Barrett can't do right now? Shoot that shit. So why are you putting him on the court with these guys? It's It was such a poor decision, which is why at this point, I don't care that R.J. Barrett has been, paying, has been playing poorly because you know this by now. You know he's been playing poorly. And the decision and the lineups to play just make him worse. So it's like... If the front office, yes, the front office has something to do with this. Of course, we cannot ignore that element of it. But you did not have to put him back into the basketball game. When we were live watching it, watching the Oklahoma City game, and you thought it was Devin Tucker going in, me too. And then I saw RJ Barrett, my heart sunk. That's where we're at. Like, it's universally known that he should not be entering games in the clutch, especially not over a boiling hot Emmanuel quickly. So what are we doing at this point? There is no excuse. I get it, Tom Thibodeau, and I want to be clear because one thing I hate, and this is the thing that I do hate, I hate having to contextualize criticism for anybody because we over here at Nick's Film School, we're pretty fair about everything, right? So if I'm criticizing Tom Thibodeau, it's not because I want him fired tomorrow. I understand he's done a great job. On the playback, I even said, look, we are losing the turnover battle by double digits and we're not getting smoked. That is a credit to Tom Thibodeau. We lost the turnover battle, I believe, by 11 points, but lost the game by nine. That's excellent. That is excellent stuff. So you can't be mad too much with Tom Thibodeau, but there are places where we can criticize him. Right now, the rotations, yeah, those are shit. I'm very sorry. They were, it, and it's not even, this is just a place where, think about where we were. We're talking about the rotations. Emmanuel quickly's not getting enough minutes. Think about where we were two weeks ago before Jericho Sims got hurt. Why was Jericho Sims starting? That was dumb. It was dumb then. It's dumb now. Pulling Emmanuel quickly out of the game for RJ Barrett was dumb the minute he did it. It's dumb today. and It's going to be dumb in a year. It's just, this is, this is the smoke that I have for Tom Thibodeau. 
He has his way of doing things. And yes, RJ Barrett has been playing poorly. I understand that. You did not have to put this poor playing basketball player back in the basketball game. And that was, that is not, that's not only a Rose thing. It's not an RJ Barrett thing. It's a Tom Thibodeau thing. And that thing right there has earned him why so in serious for the week. I forgot about the Jericho Sim shit. I should have had that in the red earlier because that was fucking <laughs> insane. <laughs> Especially yeah. now that we see what the, the Hartenstein starting five looks like. Um, yeah, the only pushback I have is like, eventually it is going to have to matter what how RJ is playing. Like, you could say you don't care, but like, he is, you I know, don't care. I want their biggest clear. assets. I want to be ahead. clear. I don't care in the context of the Tom Thibodeau evaluation today. I do care that RJ Barrett is not playing well. Brother, it, it is in a this universal context. agreement, it seems, from across the fan base. We got <laughs> Jonathan Macri criticizing Tibbs on the post game last night. That conversation, that debate has been concluded. That was not the correct decision. There is a going forward conversation to have, which is why Sean's like rent due Tibbs uh, wish is like, well, what does that look like? Does that mean... RJ Barrett plays less minutes. And if the front office isn't going to let him because they want to trade him in a couple months, RJ's going to have to play better. That's just the fact of the matter. Like, like it, it in is. order for this team to succeed, he's going to have to be better than the last year of Kobe Bryant. I I agree with that. And I'm not and I'm not giving you any pushback there. But that decision that RJ Barrett has to play X amount of minutes, yes, that does put a limit on the ceiling and that does come from the front office. Has fuck to do with Jericho Sims starting over Isaiah Hardenstein. This, yes. this is what I'm like, gonna do what I'm talking about though. Like but these are the things that and but at, to be fair, this is this was the reason why I'm saying I don't care about the RJ Barrett stuff because there's other things around that Tom Thibodeau does to shoot himself in the foot. And that is why it's it's frustrating. Like the rotations, yeah. Let's say the front office says RJ Barrett has to play whatever, 26 minutes or 28 minutes. That doesn't mean Emmanuel quickly should be playing 18. You know, like it's just there are certain ways you can you can you can parse out the minutes, right? Let's say, um, and everybody was doing on the timeline today. So let's say Jalen Brunson gets 36, so Emmanuel quickly gets the 12 that he doesn't get. So that gives you another 18 minutes that you have to find for Emmanuel quickly. If you give Emmanuel quickly 18 shooting guard minutes, that leaves 30 between who between um DiVincenzo and and DiVincenzo, unless you play DiVincenzo a little bit in that RJ place, so you can find minutes, it's possible. It's just maybe Josh Hart has to play. Maybe he's not. Maybe you have to give Josh Hart 29. I would rather you sacrifice Josh Hart's minutes than you sacrifice Emmanuel Quickly's minutes. And that's my point. That's all I'm trying to say. Emmanuel Quickly is too good to be getting less minutes than anybody other than Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle. And that needs to be evident going forward. Doesn't have, and, and you can do that with the R.J. Barrett of it all. I think but that's what's just, the lineup real quick. What's the lineup where Quickly takes minutes from Hart, though? No, quickly won't take minutes from Hart. Quickly would just, you just take said more minutes. You'd rather if you'd rather see someone to lose minutes, it should you would, be hard you would, over quickly. You would just re so let's say quick let's say the the backup um shooting guard not shooting guard, the backup small forward minutes that Josh Hart gets into. You just take some of those away from him. And maybe Julius Randle has to go from 36 to 34. And then and then you just slide over DiVincenzo or you slide over Quentin Grimes. The Quentin Grimes, um Quentin Grimes. Jalen Brunson and Emmanuel Hook lineups worked really well last year. You can yeah, go real back quick to that. that. To, to add to that, Quinn Grimes has only played 15% of his minutes at the three this year. Last year, he played 35% of his minutes at the three. So th- there is some wiggle room for Grimes it's to play there. some at the three. Yeah. That's the so, three guard lineup I would actually go to more so. If you're looking for minutes for Grimes, I just, the heart minutes honestly just have never bothered me. That's maybe where I'm, I'm coming from with my pushback is like, this very much is an RJ Barrett conversation. And it's why I think. Man, I'd, I'd love to get truth serum for to Leon Rose to be like, are you like forcing this? I guess really to Tibbs. It's like if you had your way, would RJ be playing 22 minutes? And this lineup that you've started to play more and more and more over the last couple of weeks, this this four man lineup of uh, Josh Hart, uh, quickly uh, Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle. Like if we just is that the lineup you actually want to play more, but you politically cannot because of the the parameters that you've been given, you know. I- I I've I've been thinking about something for the last few for the last few hours. Um, I just realized, by the way, I, I said we would we should stop and not go on. Now we're going significantly. Well, because you, you put up RJ, you put up you put up RJ, which is throwing the yeah. chair, and now here we yeah. are. Yeah, um, here we are. 
<laughs> Do you remember in the We Here season that Alfred Payton, who was not good, started every the game? Yeah. And the one of the reasons was that Alfred Payton, the one thing he did very well is that um, Tom Thibodeau, and this goes back to his rigidity, Tom Thibodeau likes his guards to put pressure on the rim. And even though he's, his shooting percentage was all flat the rim, Alfred Payton would take the ball to the rack repeatedly over and over and over again. What does R.J. Barrett do very, that's, very, very well? Yeah. I, part of me thinks that's why he's, that's the reason why he's in a starting lineup. And honestly, my unserious, I had three, I had my, I had three nominees. Um, one was um, the emotional Knicks fans who were react to everything on social media from ESPN. Like, please get over it. The other was uh, Mike Florio, AKA Mike Flores. We're talking all that shit about the Baltimore Ravens um, being, <laughs> they were going to get our ass kicked. Um, and I was going to ask for your, I was going to ask for your uh, okay on that. But the third one was going to be Leon Rose. Oh. Because it would be like, hey, Leon, like at some like you are the president of basketball operations. Like at some point, and I feel as if there are decisions that should be made. I think there's certain decisions that Leon has left up to Tom that other fr- other presidents of basketball operations would have said, This is what we're doing now going forward. Um, but whatever. I, I'm a, real I, quick to Mensa's yeah, point about like the Knicks spend more money than anybody else on analytics. That's that's been a reported fact. Like I'm wondering also from Leon Rose, like at what point does the analytic department that you spend so much money on also look at the numbers we all know and say like something different of like, listen, just cut the cost. He's a 20 minute player. And like, look, what I'm hoping is that RJ plays good enough that we don't have to have this conversation. And it's just like, we have nine really good basketball players and we have very few minutes to distribute to all of them. Like that, that's really a good problem for the Knicks. Um, I think it's very clear where Quickly's additional minutes should come from, though, at least from my perspective. And I guess we'll see how serious either Leon Rose or Tibbs are over the next month or so. I just I, I find it funny that we went from a collective why so unserious for Tibbs and it ended up being why so unserious for Tibbs, Leon Rose, and RJ Barrett. Which and Mike probably, Florio. Yeah. And Mike Florio somehow got thrown into it. Um, but uh, I, I think these are all great points. This is just to get a wrangle on this conversation. This is gonna be an ongoing dialogue. Like this is the end of twenty twenty three and you know, we're really early into the season. We are going to find out some answers and there are going to be some unanswered questions that as we continue to move forward, we'll continue to have these conversations here on casual Friday and on all of the KFS various podcasts. GMAC, I think you should stay up here for the end. I want to want to close it out um, just by wishing all of our listeners a happy holidays and a happy new year. Um, you know, obviously it's been an incredible year for KFS and uh, GMAC has quantified us to, to us how amazing that has been as far as like downloads and listens, but really beyond that, um, you know, the embrace that we get and have gotten on casual Friday here, you know, through the comments and on Twitter and everywhere else has really been amazing in 2023. I actually just looked it up. I was doing this while someone was talking. Sorry. I was listening passively. Um, the first casual Friday took place. <laughs> the, the first casual Friday took place in January of 2023. So casual Friday has only been uh, go ongoing in 2023. It actually did not start in 2022 of, of, of last season. So I'm not going to say which day it premiered because it is a day in January. That's not a good date in the history of this country. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to specify. At least which... I know where I was on that day. <laughs> I was recording a podcast. <laughs> Wait, that's real. The first casual Friday was January 6th. It January 6th of 2023. Chill, chill. 2023. Right, but, but yes, it the... was on January 6th. Yeah. Can we reclaim that by the way, Mensa? I know you'll be in my, my court here. Like, January 6, 2022 was the day of the R.J. Barrett buzzer beater against the Celtics. Ah. That's the January 6th I acknowledge. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. The only one I can. January 6th is R.J. Day. Okay. All right. Yes. It is R.J. Day and also Casual Friday premiere day. There are a lot of good things that have happened on January 6th. In the past two January 6th have been really good. So yes. we'll, we'll reclaim it the in that two. way. I don't know anything <laughs> that happened the last before two. This is the last Just the last two. two. <laughs> 
um, but, uh, but yeah, the point is just that we've doing this for a, a calendar year and it's been really incredible. And, you know, I'm grateful for Andrew and KFS for the opportunity and the doors that it's opened. And, you know, I just want to say cheers to all of you who are listening and I hope you all are as excited about 2024 as I and we are and continue to tune into, you know, all of the amazing KFS content that we have coming for you, uh, to you in 2024. So any last words from any of the three of you? I have one. Sean, what's your theory about New Year's resolutions? I actually believe, and I figured this out this year, that um, a New Year's resolution is actually a two-year process. Um, And I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to achieve what we want to achieve in one year. And Besides things like go to the gym or, you know, eat better or, 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 or you know, you know, whatever, you know, simple things like I'm going to clean, I'm going to be not as messy or I'm going to be better, better at work or whatever. Um, I think it's a two year process. And I say that because m- my New Year's resolution for 2023 was I actually wanted to achieve. I actually wanted to achieve balance because I felt like my life was like unbalanced because there's so much stuff going on. Like I'm a father, I'm a husband, I got work, I got KFS, I got things like to do, whatever. Um, and shout out to Cedric Shine because I told him about this. He was like, you should aim for clarity because if you, if, if you find clarity, you will achieve balance. And I was like, bet. It took me nine months to figure out what the, what the clarity was to, to get that clarity to move towards balance. And I think many people will say to themselves, you know what? I failed. I, I I didn't get it. It whatever. But I realized like, no, it took me nine months to get here, but I got here. And now I can use the next 15 months, you know, the rest of 2023 and going to 2024 to achieve it. So a New Year's resolution can be a two year process. It can be a three year process. It can be a four year process. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to achieve everything you want to achieve in 365 days, because when do we really achieve everything that we want to do in a calendar year? Yeah, that was that. I, that's totally Excellent. valid. I like that. I think that's that's a very optimistic way to look at it, and probably more realistic than the singular New Year's resolution from uh, January to December. So I like it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. So probably I, I, gonna I, fail yeah. at my New Year's resolution anyway. Like, even if it takes a year or two. Like, I, I got, I got to be honest. Like a couple of years ago, I kind of stopped with the New Year's resolution thing because, like, I, I very much believe like I, like it's usually a clear. A cleaner thing that a lot of people do with January first is the day to start something because it's oh the first day of the year. Um, I've come to learn that I just need to one day decide to do it and then it'll start. You know, that's just I think that's a better philosophy for people. Just decide one day to do it and then stick with it. It can like January first can be the impetus, but I think what mm-hmm. happens to a lot of people is that they don't achieve it and then they they move on to something else the next year and they don't achieve it and they move on to something that's next year and it's like and then 5 years later you have five things that you started that you didn't finish it was like well what if you had just stuck with one of them and said oh shit it's december 31st fuck that that's over let me move on to something else if you're stuck with it maybe at the end of 2 years you would have achieved it but to your point you're right like you don't need like it doesn't have to be january 1st like there are people that yeah. say like oh i'm going to eat better and then and it's August and it's like, well, I'm going to wait four months to start. Like, no, you can start tomorrow. So I, I, yeah. totally, I totally hear you. January 1st, you're like, I'm going to eat better. And by January 6th, it's just one <laughs> big mess. And you just don't know what to do with that big mess on January 6th. Yeah, that's an unfortunate reference. Anyway, Here, here's the other thing. I, 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 I just want to say yes. real quick, the <laughs> thing about it is I think if you want your news resolution to work within the year, make it very, 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 very small. Do not make these big like I'm going to go to the gym every day or blah, blah, blah. Like it needs to be something like I'm going to like if I drink six sodas a week, it's like I'm going to drink five. Like it needs to be small and that needs that's the only way I think that it's going to work like consistently. So that's my eat, one piece of advice. I can drink life. six sodas in a week. That's easy. <laughs> no, no, no. If you already drink six, I'm yeah. saying you re- reduce to five. Oh, you mean five. only six sodas in a week. Okay. <laughs> so my New Year's resolution is to drink this water. 
just this, just this water <laughs> bottle. Something just, consistent, but but something I'll drink easy. It, I'll, I will drink this. Will be done by the end of 2024. <laughs> <laughs> well, accomplish that goal. Just because you probably. said that, it probably won't be. Just but <laughs> I'll leave it right here. Yeah, and we'll get all the way to LA. <laughs> I <laughs> uh, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, that is that was Casual Friday. Uh, a very <laughs> as as he drank through. I told you, Claudio, is holding up a Dr Pepper. <laughs> I told zero. you, it's a zero. It's it's all up one percent better. Listen, the moment you say it's your it's your New Year's resolution, it fails. Just like the moment that that IQ comes out of the game, it fails. That yeah. is this. It is equivalent. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. Oh, all man. right. This has been a great episode. Uh, thanks for joining us on Casual Friday. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. Later.